What's up, this is Disco, and this is our series, Art Talk. We're gonna be interviewing photographers, sculptors, painters, even ceramicists. Thanks for tuning in. This is Art Talk with Disco. Welcome to another episode of Art Talk with Disco. Today we got a special guest. I wanna introduce you guys to Scott Johnson, AKA something else in the future, because we're gonna, we're gonna change that, right? <laughs> <laughs> thank you for the interview. Yeah, thank you so much. No, nah, absolutely, man. Thank you again for, for oh, coming no, on the bro. show. Yeah. This, is, this is your work here. Your work yeah. is fucking amazing, and I, and I still you. plan to buy that one. <laughs> oh, is that Ernest, is that what it is? Um, Eves. Eves, yeah. Eves, love that, love that, love that. What, what got you into art? Uh, so I've always been surrounded by a family and it's like every single generation there's good, there's always an artist or someone making art on the side. And so I grew up with a lot of my grandma's work up in the house and uh, other family members are work in the house, just surrounded by people that I knew that were making the art and making items that they liked and made them happy. And so... I um, was originally trying to be an archaeologist or an wow. anthropologist. <laughs> and so I went into, I did a month-long archaeological program in Colorado with an organization called Crow Canyon. Okay. And it was there that we spent maybe half an hour in their archival lab. And I just instantly fell in love with looking at the objects itself. Or um, kind of looking at time and looking at just fragments and bits and pieces of the past. And so that's what really got me really, really interested in art itself and then trying to replicate that in my own artwork. I see that. Even with your frames, like choosing your frames, it, it, it now kind of like dawns on me like where that comes from. I Well, the main thing that survives... Um, in the findings and the research that I was studying is ceramics, once they're fired, they can never be turned back into clay. They live almost indefinitely. And so I was obsessed with the way that ceramics almost preserves time in almost the best way possible mm. um, compared to like other objects that you see in the past, like fabric frays and paper becomes distorted nothing really bothers ceramics other than just taking care of it and loving it. And so I really liked working with ceramics because that is kind of really what I was focusing on. What kind of shaped your style? You have the ceramic work here, porcelain work with the dolls. And the craziest thing to me, and I think that, that this speaks to your artistic uh, direction, is that everything still feels very cohesive with all your work. Honestly, I... the. The first medium that I really tried to set out in performing was printmaking. Until recently that I realized like the illustrations that I do on my pottery, the faces that I do, all of them still kind of cater to that where mm. um, almost I could transform any of these into, a, again, another print. There's right. like a piece back here, the high stupid, that I actually turned into a print and I've been sending postcards of it everywhere. Whenever I have an idea for a new project, I really have like a clear direction or I always want to start a project out with as much planned as possible. Gotcha. And so one of the biggest things, especially with the frames, I really wanted the wood of the shelves and the frames that I made to all match. And so all of these frames I actually hand built. Whoa. Yeah. As you know, I recently had a show. Yeah. Uh, and frames were definitely a thing. <laughs> <laughs> As an artist, I, you know, just getting into it, I think that you forget how much goes into not only doing your art, but displaying your art, you know? Uh, so for you to go and do these handmade frames speaks to your overall creative, you know, genius. How did you create these frames? The frames, I mean, honestly, it was just it was honestly like quite a, a group effort with me and all my neighbors. These frames do look handmade. They look fairly old and they, I hate the word, but like term rustic. I'm going to be honest with you. When I saw it for the first time, I was like, oh, this fucking dude's a genius. 
like just looking at the frames, I was like, this dude's a fucking genius. I, it's something you don't see. It's something that is new. It's refreshing. Uh, it fits your work. How do you feel uh, you navigate like that sense of not comparing yourself to what's out there and just, just looking at your art in, in something that's pure to you? Uh, especially still going to school and having critiques, it's like very often that a lot of people try to compare each other's work. Right. Um, and so the first ever um, art piece that I made in school, it was a hanging mobile sculpture that was all about ants taking over a picnic. And I hung it up and as I was getting critiqued, um, the wire snapped and my entire piece fell to the ground and shattered and broke. And I couldn't help but laugh because <laughs> I was like, of course this would happen. Right. It was like, of course, out of all things. Um, and my teacher said something that it's like, I still stick with, which is, um, it's not a mistake, it's a learning curve. Mm. And so that's kind of how I see the rest of my projects. It's kind of why I'm very open to working in a ton of different mediums because once I start working in a specific medium, it can only go up from there, I feel. I think the way that I kind of collect it together, again, as you said, it's like I like making something that's cohesive, and so I try to find something that I can almost, or a symbol or like a style that I can almost make my own so that even if I work in sculpture or then I go into, again, ceramics or woodwork or graphite, they'll all accumulate together so that someone can know even though one medium is point A and one medium is point B, it's still a cohesive situation. Cohesive. Yeah. Nice. Um, let's talk about your, uh, I guess, people who inspired you. Uh, I really started falling in love with, again, a lot of older work, a lot of people that um, not necessarily like in an experimental movement, but more or less artwork where people almost opened the doors mm -hmm. or created a new movement or created a new genre. And so I've always been in love with specifically 1970s contemporary art. Um, there's all the pieces by Yoko Ono. There's the writings and the stories of Joe Brainard. But I feel though that a lot of the artists that I've now come to see as like me loving the most or mm -hmm. being inspired by the most, a lot of it comes from um, artwork that I almost create or that I almost accumulate. And then someone tells me, oh, have you heard of this artist? It's always mm. the artist referencing another artist. Right. But the more I reflect, because I'm, again, I'm still a student, I'm like still early in my career. I think this is the time when I should be reflecting, should be studying, should be accumulating as much as I can so that in the future I can always reference something. I know early on in my career, uh, I kind of had like a fight with myself internally mm -hmm. where I was like, should I go out and see other people's work or should I just block that out and just stay in my own lane mm. and just try to like create something that's just like within me right but i think that the problem with that is that when you do that um you're only as limited as to what you actually see right mm -hmm. so I think it is smart to go out and and find references and other artists and and what they do the thing about it is is if you don't know something is is even capable, you don't even know to push that far. Yeah. So to see that something is possible beyond your scope of view actually helps you to create further. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? And to elevate your game, you know, because everybody has, you know, a different eye or vision or, you know, or or sense of how to go about something. But with those references, um, I think that that just helps push it. Yeah, I actually have a lot to say on that um, because I was always in a conflict with myself as well about not necessarily looking at other people's artwork, 
but um, of my individuality. Mm -hmm. I was always stressed that I was copying someone or I always hated when someone said, oh, your artwork reminds me of this artist or, oh, have you looked at this artist? But then again, I, as I mentioned earlier, I've kind of changed my, again, my mindset on that issue right. because there is a quote, I'm forgetting the name of the person who said it, but it is, art is anything that you can get away with. It's one of my favorite quotes and it kind of just generalizes the art world for me that there is so much repetition and there is going to be someone who does work like you because stories nonetheless will overlap. But again, everyone isn't going to know about one singular artist. People might be making work that looks like someone's work a hundred years ago, but again, new work has to be created. New work always is going to be fueled by a necessity to see art. Do you, how do you see your career in art going? I still, I make art. I love making art, but it's always something that I really like to do and I put a lot of effort into it, yet it's still something that I see coinciding with my studies in art history. I mean, I'm, I'm open to anything. I'm, I have an idea in mind and that's all that I really need. It's a learning curve and I'm kind of really happy to be on that learning curve. Um, Again, I can't really predict anything. And so I'm kind of happy to see where the wind takes me. So uh, let everybody know where they can find you, um, where they can buy your work. The best way to contact me would be on my our Instagram, Green Olives for breakfast. Um, and then slowly but surely, I'll also be coming out with a website in the next week, which should be olivesforscott.com. There we go, Scott, Mr. Olive Johnson. Thank you. It's a pleasure, man. Thank you. Thank you. We're out.